Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the State of the Empire video for turn 59. I think I got the last turn disordered. I might have said 57 or 58, but this one's definitely 59. The reason I can actually check this now is uh, if I go over here to the actual saves, when it opens up, there we go, we can see turn 59. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of strange, like, it seems like uh, it, it's almost as if me and THD are out of sync, but the reason is because, obviously, like, technically my turn 1 is, like, the prior game turn, so it's kind of it's kind of strange there, really. Like, uh, my turn is the 7th of December. I don't know if you got to do anything on the 7th of December, or whether it just went straight to the 8th of December. So, not gonna lie. Not played a play by email really from the Allied perspective from the actual start of the game, so I can't really say to that. But yes, here we are, turn 59, State of the Empire for the Imperial Japanese Empire. What are we doing here lately? Well, see, <laughs> the big one really has got to be in regards to China. This is where all the things are going to be kicking off next turn. Uh, but I really did want to especially make the uh, State of the Empire video here to just really drive home the point that we are going to take losses here at Changsha. I just want to make that known to you people here. We are going to take probably very high losses. It's going to feel very high, but this is due to the fact that there's just that, that many numbers involved here. Uh, we do have 110,372 infantry, 168,862 second line infantry. Uh, 1,186 engineers, 20 engineer vehicles. I wish we had more engineer vehicles, but we don't particularly need massive amounts here anyway. Uh, 2,837 vehicles in total, 2,461 guns in total as well. So I just want to drive home really that these are very large numbers. These are very large amounts of men. So it is natural that we are going to lose a lot of men here, but we will be able to rebound from that quite quickly. So yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We have ordered the attack on Changsha at long last. I've been talking about this for some time yet, but we really are finally in a position where we are able to do this. The good news is we will have additional regiments moving into the uh, city of Changsha. I think they should arrive next turn. It might be the turn afterwards. It does depend really on the terrain. I'm going to have to just take a look. I believe they move like... Uh, depends on what, what terrain are they on. So they're in wooded here then, so let's take a look. Wooded. Okay, forested. So, I think they move five per phase, but I'm really going to have to double check that. Sometimes uh, there's a little big mechanics in the game that I do end up forgetting sometimes, and I need to get doubly sure on LCU movement. But indeed, we will have the 77th and the 78th regiments in the actual city there the turn afterwards, or the turn after that. Uh, the 9th Independent Engineer Regiment is going to be very welcome, those additional engineers. Though these are just normal engineers and not Imperial Japanese Army engineers, they're not quite as good in the battles. They still have the capability, but they're not as good. If I go over here then to troops. Okay, infantry. Now, let's see. Right, IJ infantry squads. Whereabouts are they? Right, there we go. IJ engineer squads. So you can really see why engineers are very good here. You can see that the Imperial Japanese Infantry Squad for 1943 there has 25 anti-armor, which is really quite interesting. I imagine there's probably not many uh, divisions that probably will have that. So I'd have to really find out what unit that actually went to. So you can see it's available from 1943. I mean, potentially we just have a increase in uh, infantry firepower, but it's, I don't know. It's one of those there, really. And we can see here, the actual standard INJ Infantry Squad has 5 anti-armor, 20 soft. Uh, there does appear to be differences here in the table equipment for the actual squads, or at least the actual squads equipment. You can see here we have an Imperial Japanese Army Infantry Squad that has 22. Uh, yeah, you can see the same availability here. Motri Squad, Para Squads over here. We can see this is why engineers are good. As far as I'm aware, anti-armor does basically work against... I suppose this is hard attack versus soft attack. I believe it actually does work against the fortifications, which would make sense for engineers. So if you take a look, there's engineers over here. I think this is just generic engineers. I don't know if there's any differences in engineers between different nations. We do have the IGA engineers. So I don't know if we have, like, Japanese engineers as such. It doesn't seem that way. You can see here that the US Marine Corps Rifle Squads, they have a lot of like actual potential. Their, their equipment is just superb. Absolutely superb. Yeah, combat engineers. There we go. Uh, but yeah, that gives you a good idea of why we need the IGA engineers for this sort of task. 
They're very good at it. Very, very good at it. I think, uh, what do they have? 25, and I think the normal is about 5 for an infantry squad. So it's like equivalent to like 5 squads, basically. So they are worth their weight in gold, really. Well, yes. Now, the big thing over here at Changsha is going to be... Well, this is it. We have a lot riding on this, not so much on the first attack, but on this actual campaign here. A lot riding here. The reason being, this first attack is going to be rebuffed without a doubt. I do not imagine they're going to break through with Changsha, unless the supply situation is far worse than we actually imagined for THD in China. But I doubt that one. I imagine he's got enough to supply, uh, probably for a day of battle, maybe two days of battle. It depends really on how much has been used. But really what we want to find out here then is the state of the actual enemy forces here. You can get an idea from bombardment, you can get an idea from uh, a number of different factors. But this is where you really get the true, true knowledge of the enemy here. We'll be able to see the factors that are affecting it. So we'll be able to see like uh, negative leaders or just penalties such as that. That'd be good information there. But yeah. Uh, another thing that I really want to see here then is whether or not he has built fortifications. If he has built fortifications, then that is actually a good thing. It will cost us more men, it will cost us time, and it will cost us men to break through those fortifications. But the reason why fortifications are good is, well, from looking over on the forum, uh, from a link I was sent, it does appear that level 4 fortifications, for example, cost about 5,000 supply or something of that nature. Like, each level of fortifications costs you a different amount of engineer points. And engineer points, you gain, like, one per turn, I think it is, or per phase, uh, for each, like, uh, engineer squad that you have. Like, engineer vehicles are worth multiple squads. I can't, I think they're worth five. I forget how many is exactly. Uh, but indeed. So this is why you want lots of engineers to be built up fortifications, because obviously you need to have lots of engineers and lots of engineer points. But I think there is a cost associated in terms of, like, supply. It might be, like, um... I can't remember exactly what it is, but it, from what I read, it seems like level 4 fortifications is about 5,000 supply, or something in that sort of region. It's a good chunk of supply anyway. The reason is, like, level 1 is quick, level 2 uh, not so quick, level 3 gets uh, progressively harder, level 4 is harder, level 5 harder. Uh, level 6, I believe if you want to fortify something beyond level 6, you need to have 25,000 uh, tons of supply there basically at all times, unless, well, and if you don't, the, the actual construction stops there. So, yeah, it's hard to build fortifications. You've got to imagine, like, let's say, a level 8 or 9 fortification is probably, like, something akin to, like, the Maginot line or the Siegfried line. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's concrete uh, pillboxes, bunkers, interwoven fields of fire. Like the dragon's teeth that you saw on the Siegfried line. Yeah, so definitely quite a heavy investment to defensive uh, fortifications there. But indeed, I mean, if we take a look at the actual um, terrain over here. So if we take a look at Changsha, it is UI, or UL, sorry, which is urban light. So you can see here, they do have a times two defensive value. So the thing is, it's not going to be the bad bad. It's going to be bad, but it's not going to be just catastrophic. For example, we have urban heavy here, which is the most... Well, this is the mo well, I suppose that's the, uh, <laughs> there's not much worse than that. Because that is the worst, worst terrain to be fighting an offensive battle in, in the game. As you can see here, Hankou is urban heavy. So it's like in, uh, <laughs> in a number of ways. We did see him march his forces out here from Chang last turn. If he was to actually march these forces to Hankou, he would not be able to take the city. The reason being level, well, times four defensive terrain. Uh, there's uh, level 4 fortifications here. I'm just shy of level 5 fortifications. I'm not building them up now because they actually do require a lot of supply, so I'm actually going to put that uh, well, on hold while he's not moving, if, well, moving the infantry. Oh dear, again, tongue-tied today. This is it. I'm, I'm so excited about this. So excited about the possibilities. It's unreal. Now, the big, big one that we want to see here, then. And the thing is with this, it's so hard to really predict on how things are going to go in a number of ways. Now, this is the base that we are really interested in. And I've got to make this point clear here, guys. Uh, if you're watching the series, please, 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 please do it. Uh, accept the responsibilities of the uh, guarded, well, I suppose you could say the uh, sensitive information that you're about to hear about. So it's one of these things, do not be down THG, and yeah, just keep things to yourself. 
It's like the same for like people who are watching the Imperial Japanese side. Don't be telling me what THD is doing, so yeah, just trying to make that point clear. But indeed, this city over here is really... It is almost like the key to our future here in China, in a number of ways. So we have the city here of Chikyang, or Chikyang. The reason for that is, as far as we can identify, as far as we can work out, the actual city here has been on garrison for a number of days, which is incredibly important. The reason being, the position it sits on is actually on one of the road networks over here, and if we were able to take this base, we'd be able to cut that road network, and then I'd move a unit over here to cut this road network off as well. But the main reason why this city is so very important is because it's on the other side of the river. It is wooded rough, so that is Tang's free defensive terrain. And also, if I take control of this, not only is it going to really hurt his supply lines, as obviously the supply is going to have to come through here, but the fact that, well, this other road here as well. But the fact is, well, <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> it's not good for him. It is not a good time for him there. Uh, you can see urban light infrastructure over here at uh, China. Well, urban light at Changsha, sorry. Urban light terrain. Now, urban light is fantastic. Not to fight in, not, well, not to fight against, because it still is times two. It's going to hurt. But if you take a look over here, then, as you can see, supply cost is only 10, so it's very cheap. It is as cheap as it's going to be. Uh, but everything moves at full speed through here, which is just amazing. Absolutely amazing. But what I want to point out here then is Urban Light is effectively the same as Clear. The only difference is the fact that it's a times two defensive bonus there. Defensive value, I should say. Apologies about being tongue-tied. It usually happens when I've not streamed all day or something like that. I was only getting tongue-tied. <laughs> uh, but indeed. So we have the Urban Light there. On the other side of the river, we do have the Clear Terrain, Clear Terrain. Now, this is wooded, and what I'll do is actually I'll draw it on, and it's a little bit easy for you guys to actually see here. Sometimes I can appreciate it is a little bit hard. So, what I'll do then is highlight the areas that are clear. Okay. So, this area here is all clear, barring this one hex here. So, this is all clear, which means that we have just... It's amazing. We're going to fight like lions. Absolute lions in this terrain over here. Bear in mind that there really isn't that much clear terrain over here in China. Like, we do have bands of like, clear terrain, like over here there's some clear terrain, there's a little bit of clear terrain around here. Over here on the coastline. But the vast majority is over here in the north of China. We do have this here in the uh, center of China, but this is really the only... I suppose you could say the last... The last uh, morsel of clear terrain as we advance towards Chuking. Or Chongqing. As you can see, this is all rough, wooded rough. Uh, we see mountains over here. Jungle rough over here. It's not good. It is not good. So, this is really the area that we can absolutely devastate the Chinese army. Now, I don't have to destroy his forces per se. I have to bleed them white. And what I mean by that is we have to bleed them white to supply. The, um... It's one of these things, I would say it's probably the folly that DHD has made in this game so far, in our game so far. He's a very good player, but I think this is a, uh, I think it's a wrong, I think it is the wrong approach to the land, land war in China. He's actually having all of his forces on the front lines. I mean, he does have forces over here at his garden bases. I don't know what else he has here, this base appears to be empty as far as I can tell. But these other bases, well, I don't know about that yet, I don't know what else he has here, does he actually have them garrisoned. But we can see that he has 30 units over here. We see 13 here, 14. We see another unit over there. We did see a good 150,000 over here in Nanyang. Uh, there might have been another 150,000 here that retreated towards Cyan. We see here 5 units, 4 units, 1 there, 4 over there, 6 there, another 9 there, and then 2 here. So the thing is, it looks as if he's gone for really a frontal frontal deployment of all his units, really concentrated on this area here, which I can understand, but the thing is, even when you have the river, the thing is, I'm going to make that uh, first crossing, which is going to be a shock attack, but we are fighting clear terrain, so it doesn't particularly matter what you do, you're not going to be able to really do much about it. You can fortify, but the fortifications will be broken, and they can be destroyed. It's, it's not so very easy to build those fortifications up, especially in the middle of a battle. So that's something to bear in mind. This is why you want to really base your defenses on something that has, like, a hard uh, defensive bonus. 
it's the reason why Han Kao would be an absolute nightmare for him to take. Like, we're struggling to take center, well, centers such as the Wooded Rough over here, which is Wang Kao, which is a times three, or Numea, uh, which is a uh, times three jungle rough. So, this is it. So, you can imagine a times four would be even harder. Not to mention the fact that it is a port. There's a lot of supply here, and I do have a lot of men there. So, the reason why this city is important, I do have. Yes, yeah, so we have the second raid and regiment on the way at the moment. So, they're moving via rail. They're moving via rail to Lu Chao over here. And from Lu Chao, I do have some Kai 57i Topsies ready to take them out and transport them, have them basically land over here at Chikyang. The reason why we're going to do that is we're going to take control of the actual road over here to take control of this base if it is indeed ungarrisoned. But it actually puts me on the other side of the river. It gives me a position that I can work from. I could then immediately begin to, well, reinforce it. But the fact is, I'm hoping, and uh, us over here on the Chrysanthemum Order channel on Discord, we are really hoping uh, that this is going to cause a collapse in the Chinese forces in this area of China, if not the entirety of China, due to the void that is going to have to be filled there. But the fact is, uh, it's going to probably take about two or three attacks for us to really win out here at Changsha, ideally just two. But once we do cross the actual river over here, and we actually are in the clear terrain, his forces are going to be beaten up. Our own forces are going to be beaten up as well. But the fact is, we have 7,143 assault value. I still have additional forces on the way over here. So, for example, I do have another division moving out the 61st, sorry, the 6th, uh, 6th division. Uh, we do have a brigade over here as well. We do have the regiments. So, we do still have some uh, fresh forces that are trickling in. We have the 104th division over here. I may potentially turn the 38th division around, but I'm not like to do that due to the fact that I need them over in Malaya. So, we do have another fresh division. This fresh division of 104th is marching over here, just south of Hengyang. Now, the idea is going to be that uh, we'll fight the Battle of Changsha, the first Battle of Changsha, and we'll receive a bloody nose, but we'll give the Chinese a bloody nose as well, but more importantly is we're going to be draining their supply. Now, it's going to take a, probably about a day or two for the actual paratroopers to make it up here to Lu Chao, then they're going to unpack. So maybe two, three days before they're ready. Which gives our forces in Changsha... Uh, today to launch the attack while the paratroopers are moving and then in the meantime we're gonna have maybe two three days to actually rest and then we'll launch another attack what I'd like to do if if this base stays empty I mean it might be that we do it just as soon as we can just to ensure that we could try and take the base uh, but what I'd like to do is uh, on the second battle of Changsha the second time that we do attack we have that timed uh, to link up with the actual paratroopers drop in, which is not essential. If I can get the paratroopers in, I'm probably going to drop them in immediately. But the reason I would do that is because then it's going to leave his forces really in a very bad position. Because the thing is, they're either going to be pushed out of Changsha or they're going to have to retreat. If they're trying to retreat, they're going to get absolutely annihilated in battles. It's going to be horrific scenarios for him. But what we want to do here then is, once we do force him to retreat from Changsha, or we are in the... I suppose just... Uh, just... Just seconds away from forcing him to leave Changsha. We're going to have the uh, 104th Division begin to attempt to uh, cross over here at Hengyang. Now it's going to get butchered, it's going to be uh, hurting, but ideally these guys are going to be looking to get the hell out of here because the thing is, once this base falls here, well, what's he going to do? He's either uh, going to retreat down the rail line over here I'm trying to make it up, with, uh, make it up over here. And the beauty is, like, once we take this base, if we can take that base, that is, it means that I have significantly... <laughs> I, I can get here faster than he can get here. And the thing is, for him to get from there to there, he's going to have to try and go in strategic mode. I mean, the Chinese can use strategic transport for the road network, but I don't know how long that takes. But the thing is, he still has to go into strategic uh, transport mode. But ideally, we can take this base and prevent him from actually moving strategically to here. Um... He can obviously still make use of the roads, but the fact is, we're being clear terrain here. I will have the tanks that are moving at 30 miles per hour. Well, 30 miles per phase, I believe it is. Or, like, in a turn or per phase. That's something I'm going to have to double check. But the fact is, he will not be able to outrun me here. So then we get into a situation of where I might be able to envelop the Chinese forces. And once they're low on supply, or once they're out of supply, they're going to begin to fight at, like, one-third their AV. So, for example, if there's 5,000 AV here, if they're low on supply, they're going to fight at one-third of that. It's just... It's going to be 
collapse. It is going to be a complete collapse of the Chinese forces over here. And the thing is, the supply situation is a black hole for China then. He does actually get 500 uh, tons of supply each turn coming in from the Burma Road over here. But the thing is, if you're not spending thousands and upon thousands of tons of supply, you just can't replace it fast enough. You just can't. Which is fantastic. And the fact is, if he's building fortifications here, I mean, I really do hope he's built fortifications along uh, the line over here of these other bases. Because the thing is, those fortifications will have drained supply. So it's going to push him to a point of where he's just he's just really balancing on the precipice. Of where he really, he can potentially sustain battle for one or two days. But beyond that point, he probably can't sustain battle. Well, as we can. And this is it. Over here at this point, you can see that we have 26,471 tons of supply. Now, this is a monthly requirement of supplies here for this force over here, which is 220, uh, sorry, no, uh, 22,255. Now, we have about, uh, I don't know, how many, how many troops do we have here? Okay, so we have about 270,000 troops, maybe 280,000 troops here in grand total, which is actually a lot of troops for Japan, actually, a lot of troops. But the fact is, he has 320,000 here, more or less. Another 54,000, 32,000, don't know how much there. Uh, 36,000, 60,000, good few thousand there. He has 138,000 there, another 8,200 there. So the fact is, he's got a good half million plus men in this area. So the thing is, he's, he's having to use a lot of supply. Like, if we're having to spend that much supply here to keep our forces in the field, you can imagine he's having to spend a very similar amount. I mean, obviously that's in a month. But the fact is, I just want you guys to take note here. So this is 26,000 tons of supply. When we actually do attack, this number is going to be just dropping massively. Now, the average Japanese uh, division requires about 1,000 tons of supply. The average, uh, sorry, no, the average Chinese corps, I believe, requires about 600 tons of supply. So they do require less supply, but the thing is they have less supply to begin with anyway. So it's going to be superb. But what we're going to have to be doing here then is being very diligent, diligent, looking after our forces, making sure I can force supply up over here. What I'm going to be doing then is having these convoys that are moving up the Yangtze, uh, Yangtze River. I'm going to have them move into Shanghai and then I'm going to have the supply pumped into Wuchang over here. If I can stop uh, the construction of certain uh, facilities, I will do. Like over here, I've stopped the fortification work. You can see that we were just starting to move towards level 5 fortification, so I've stopped that. I've stopped fortifying over here. I am expanding the airfield because I think it is worthwhile having that airfield expansion here at Hankou. It really is in the center of China, the heart of China, so it's very useful for me to actually have there. But indeed, it is going to be a bloodbath. But it is a necessary battle, and it is a battle that we can win. If we take this... We're then in a position where half the distance, you can see here, we have the actual base here. Uh, this, let's take a look. So this is clear terrain, that's clear terrain, that's clear terrain. We'd be able to just march up over here, we'd be moving at full speed. We'd have one hex of wooded rough, and then we'd be here at the base. And then the thing is, wow, you can imagine, if he's not here in strength, if he's not here in strength, I could begin to then potentially send a division to march down here, or send a couple divisions to march on Chongqing. And the fact is, if I can actually block these roads off over here, if I can actually disconnect him from Chongqing, from Chongqing, sorry, within a, <laughs> within a very much, within a, a, a uh, <laughs> an end game scenario for China, it could very literally bring about a defeat of China within the year. If we can manage this, probably within less time, but I'd say about a year, we probably would be looking at a defeated China. Uh, so this is very exciting, very, very exciting. And I apologize for getting tongue-tied about it. It's just me being very excited about it. Now over here in Indian China, well, actually, we'll speak about uh, Nanning over here on the border. I do have the Fourth Independent Mixed Brigade. Uh, they're going to arrive at Nanning tomorrow. We do have another Mixed Brigade over here, the twenty-first, which is going to arrive sometime later. I mean, they march from Hanoi, these guys march from just here. Well, actually, no, from just here, and it's taken them far longer. And you can see that is really what happens when you're marching through bad terrain. So you can imagine if the Chinese are going to have to march through this train over here. Now, they can move strategically on certain roads, but I think they have to be a certain quality Like I think they have to be the big roads like this. So he might not be able to march, well, strategically march along this road, but I'm not entirely, uh, not entirely sure. So uh, don't take my word on that one. Okay. So over here then, I am waiting for the 38th Division to arrive. 
they're heading down to Canton, where they're going to be picked up and shipped out. I do have the 21st Infantry Division over here. They're being shipped out of China. So they're, uh, I'd say they're probably about uh, a week, maybe a week or two out from their proper positions down here at Singapore. Now over here at Singapore, we will be marching onto the causeway tomorrow. You can see these guys have one more day before they're unpacked. So tomorrow they will be ready. So tomorrow is when we begin to march across the causeway. It's going to take, it won't take us long to actually march across there, depending on the terrain. Yeah, it shouldn't take us too long to march onto Singapore. Maybe two, maybe a day or two, three days, something like that. But it's not going to take us long. But it is going to be a horrendous loss of life over here as we march onto Singapore. But the fact is, once we do march onto Singapore, then this siege truly does begin for the most vital possession of the British crown out here in the Far East. Uh, obviously, besides uh, Hong Kong, which has already fallen. So the good news is it's going gonna, it's gonna to probably crush one or two divisions, maybe. But we do have four divisions that will cross, and the rest of the forces will cross after them. So at least we'll have reinforcements there, and we'll have forces that can actually like help to alleviate the issues there. Um, but the good news is we have the 21st Division. They're not too far out. So once the 21st Division arrives, obviously it'll be uh, sent down here via rail. But we'll be able to rotate one of the battered divisions out and have it rest over here at Johor Bahru, or potentially even have it rest over there at Bangkok. Uh, maybe somewhere somewhere with like a lot of supplies or a lot of support. So this is it really. In time we'll have the 38th Division available as well. So that's good news. But uh, this is very exciting over here. Now, over here at Bangkok, we are launching a sweep against Rangoon. So I do have 68, count them, 68 Ki-43s here. You can see that we have two in reserve here. And another four in reserve here. We do have another five here that aren't ready as of yet. So these squadrons are large. Yeah, two days before these guys are available. But we have 24 already now. We have four in reserve. They're using drop tanks and they are going to sweep Rangoon at 27,000 feet. The reason why I'm sweeping at 27,000 feet is if I take a look over here. So combat reports. Let's see. Yep. Yeah. So these aircraft were accidentally lost because I still left them on a setting and I forgot to change them to just resting. We can see here, even with the loss of these aviators, we were able to actually decipher really important information. Like for example, we can see that, the, uh, that he has some P-40E Warhawks at 26,000 feet, the Hurricane 2B Tropicals are at 25,000 feet, 20,000 feet, and the Blenheims at 15, 15 with the Buffalo. We get to see what his actual combat aerotrol is made up of. The fact is we get to see that he actually does have a combat air patrol. We also note that he has a 21st Light AA regiment over here. So the thing is, if we're flying at 27,000 feet, that Light AA isn't going to be able to touch us. It's only going to be like something heavier. And the good news is we can see here then, from the three units he has on Ragoon, uh, we can actually, well, we can work out that one of those units is a Light AA regiment. So that leaves two units. So potentially one of them is a headquarters, potentially one of them is like an engineer unit. Uh, but we can actually work out that Rangoon is actually not very well protected here at the moment. So obviously he's putting most of his forces over here. So he has four units here. He has two units here. So the thing is, he doesn't really have that much strength over here in Burma. I mean, this is all posturing. I mean, he's, uh, he's hurt one Thai division. I mean, he obviously did cause a lot of damage to that Thai division. But that Thai division doesn't really mean that much to me. I mean, in time I'll be able to recover it. But ultimately, it's, it's not going to change anything over here. If anything, it might make him overconfident, but what we'll do then is we'll punish that. So that's the plan over here, we're going to sweep over here at Rangoon. And then what I'm going to be looking towards doing then, uh, we do actually have some ki 15s over here. They're going to be running reconnaissance of Rangoon over here. So once we actually know what he has on the airfields, what I'm hoping here to do then is actually get the, um, well, get the jump on him, really. If I can drive his air power out from Rangoon then his forces on the ground here are going to be really without uh, much in the way of support. So then what I can do is I can just bomb them. Just keep bombing them, just keep harassing them, keep uh, forcing them to use supply. Just really make their time rough. Which is what we're looking for. If we take a look at the map, uh, not that one, the weather map, there we go. So you can see this is actually the malaria zone, so he's going to take a lot more in terms of like, disruption and fatigue over here. So if we can bomb him and cause him to actually, well, to have those numbers build up, that's really good for us. It's going to hurt his troops. And then eventually when we do march into Burma, at least they're going to be in a poorer position. But ideally we can shoot down some of his aircraft that did escape from Singapore over here, which is the plan there. So we do have additional aviation moving in here. Yeah, you can see that this has been unloaded. I'm going to have a number of these units moved out to these different bases over here. 
We do have a good number of bombers over here, so you can see that we do have the KI-21s. Uh, so you can see we have a fair few of them, obviously not massive numbers. There's a few squadrons that we haven't to build up since I was at losses a few times ago. But eventually we'll be able to build them up into a fully functional unit, well, fully functional squadrons again in the future. But a good few bombers over there. Uh, what we're doing out here from Johor Baru. Uh, we have the 3rd Air Division, which is going to be fully unpacked tomorrow. But as you can see, they have a command radius of 4. So their job is actually to enable all these bases within range to be able to use torpedoes. As you can see, Johor Baru can use torpedoes. Mersing, Malacca, Kuala Lumpur itself, Kuantan, uh, Tamala, Kota Baru, and Taiping can use torpedoes. Georgetown unfortunately can't. But basically, everything here would enable us to use uh, naval bombers with torpedoes, which is really very good. So what we have down here at Johor Bru is we have the G3M2s and the G4M1s. They are being escorted by the A6M20s, which are running drop tanks. And we do have uh, 1 damaged and 12 in maintenance, so we're going to have a good number of them available tomorrow. Another uh, 4 there are going to be available. Well, 3 are going to be available after that. A little bit longer maintenance. And then obviously we do have a damaged one. So yep, they're flying out to 14 hexes. So as you can see over here, this is 14 hexes out from Johor Bru. Whew, God, I'm getting... Whew, need to breathe. Need to breathe. Ah, there we go. Yeah. So, that's 14 hexes out from Singapore. Sorry, no, sorry, from uh, Johor Bru. The idea here is that I'm able to actually fly torpedo bombers, well, torpedo armed bombers out of this area here. The issue is I'm going to get caught up attacking these uh, ships over here at Palembang, but that's only going to last so long. But the fact is, uh, from this position over here, I'm able to reach out. And not just over there, but over here as well. So the thing is, if he's attempting to actually escape from this area, he is going to have to run the gauntlet of the naval torpedo bombers. So more than likely, he's going to be moving out this way and head in like, basically this direction. Uh, but what I'm hoping to do in the future is, once I do have the Mili Kidipatai uh, Riyadh, is potentially head up this way. But we do have our submarines over here, so ideally with, like, naval search, I could try and pick up from these guys trying to escape. But ideally, he will just head up this way, or he'll head that way, or he'll head that way. Uh, we'll have to see. But we are trying to hit him with the actual naval bombers. Okay. Now, setting out... Yeah, here we go. Now, setting out from Kotobaru is the 94th task force so they are carrying elements of the well they are carrying the 124th infantry regiment is it an infantry regiment or is it infantry um yeah infantry regiment yes the 124th now bear in mind these are the guys that fought at mercing for that length of time not all of them but a good chunk of them fought at mercing for a hell of a long time so these guys have seen some uh, they've seen some crap so yes we have them they're going to be heading from Kotobaru to Sinkawang. I do have this force over here, which is going to be meeting about this point over here. Let's see. Yeah, right. Okay, so we've got the Engineering Koi over here, which is a JNAAF. And we've got the Sassibo SLF and another JAAF uh, company. So these guys are going to be linking up. And then what they're going to be doing is linking up with the actual transports as they arrive about this point here as well. I do have a light cruiser, the Notori, three destroyers are heading out here. From over here at Saigon, I do have the Kitakami and the Oi, and two additional destroyers. So what we're doing here then is we are building a large task force that is actually geared towards the landing at Sinkwang. At Sinkwang, we can see he has 3,280 troops over there, supposedly. The airfield is somewhat damaged, but the good news is, at least with the engineers over here, I could begin to repair the airbase here. And uh, I'd look to be able to use that to launch, well, I don't know, reconnaissance fighters, bombers to a degree. Not so much in the way of bombers, but at least having the airbase would be nice. But indeed. Uh, so that's the plan over there. Okay. So indeed, these guys are hunting down here. They're really in position to try and sink anything leaving this area. What I'm going to do, um, what I'm going to do actually, is actually have some of these submarines move over to this position here. And just really try and turn this into a submarine hunting area. Hunting grounds, I suppose you could say. Right, over here at Kandari. We do have, as you can see, we have a G4M1 Betis. Now, they have a range of 17 hexes. They are torpedo armed. So you can see that's 16 hexes. There we go, that's 17 hexes. So as you can see, they have range up to this point over here. So as you can imagine... 
Yeah, back are in this area. With torpedoes. So, really what I'm trying to do here, then... ...is I'm trying to lock down the Java Sea. So, as you can imagine, this point over here, then, is when I can actually hit with the torpedo bombers. It's something like from this point over here that I can hit with torpedo bombers as well. Uh, we do have our submarines over here, so what I need to do then is fill out this area with the torpedo, sorry, with the submarine bombers, sorry, uh, submarines as well, actually, in addition to the bombers. But as you can see, this is the only area that it really has that is actually not able to be covered by a uh, Japanese naval bomber as of yet. That's not going to last forever. The thing is, I'm going to be able to escort these raids as well. I'd love to be able to escort them from Makassar right now, but unfortunately I can't at this moment in time. But I am moving in additional supply, I'm moving in additional engineer coys as well. Really building up Makassar to be uh, really there uh, to actually fuel the offensive. To have uh, the bombers actually covered by fighters, which is excellent. Now, we did lose a destroyer and we did lose a destroyer transport over here on the land as an bomb last turn. We did have a four battleship bombardment, which did inflict about 300 or so casualties. The heavy cruisers inflict some casualties as well, but you can see the heavy cruiser Takao uh, did take some return shots from the uh, defenders here at Ambon with a 150mm coastal battery. But the good news is we do have elements of the 65th Brigade landed here. So we have 1,433 infantry, uh, 448 support. So they don't quite have an. Well, yeah, you can see here support required. Yeah, they only have. Uh, pff, well, <laughs> they only have like a six of the actual support they require, so they do need additional support. But the idea here is we have troops on the ground, so you can't really get anything in or out. Obviously, if he retreats, he's going to be uh, lost. But I, what we're going to be doing here then is we're going to have this task force over here, which is carrying the 3rd JNAF uh, engineer unit. They do have some SLF squads in them, so the good news is I'll be able to take this base at Namala. Uh, the turn after more than likely, unless they actually do an amphibious landing and actually do a shock attack on the same turn. So I'll actually have some aviation engineers over here, which is nice. It's not exactly required, but it's more so I can actually have the uh, supply over here. You can see they're carrying 2.4 thousand tons of supply. Uh, having some aviation support is always nice in different islands. But what I'm going to be looking towards doing then is having this open as a possibility. I do have the Yasukuni Maru and the Kishino. The Kishino is really the most important ship in this area right now. And if she is lost, it's going to hurt me. It isn't going to really set us back, but it is going to be... It would hurt. It would cause uh, a lot of problems. What we're doing here then is we're moving the AS and the AKA uh, to Copang. Now, I do have the oiler over here, but what I'm going to do then is for the time being, wait for additional tankers to arrive in the area, or send actual cargo ships over here to Copang uh, to actually allow our warships to bleed them dry, and then I can have them rotated back to Kendari, and uh, they can fuel up over there. I don't want to risk the oiler as it is an important ship. I don't really have other oilers in the area right now. So it's a very big important target. So yeah, uh, what we're doing here then is trying to make the most of our surprise. We do have forces over here at Copang. We do have 2,400 infantry, 2,124 uh, second line troops. So we have the 4th Division B detachment. We are sending the ki 431 bs to do long range uh, combat air patrol over Task Force 53, which was attacked by low-flying Allied naval bombers. Well, Allied bombers, so we are going to be doing that. But the base at Copang will fall. We do have the uh, broken-up elements of the Kidipatai. So we have first element over here with Ryujo and Hosho. And then we have Zuiho and Taiyo over here as well. So their task is to head down here. So they're moving to this position here, this position here, roughly. And they're going to be moving, uh, yeah, they're going to move one more day towards Perth. I'm hoping to try and catch anything in this area. But I think what I will be doing then is potentially either have them go a little bit north and then back, or have them go back and be done to Copang. It's going to depend on the situation and just see what happens there, really. So that's the general idea over here. We're hoping to um, catch any stragglers on the convoy routes. Try and sink anything and evacuate in here. But just in general, I want to secure the area. I want to impose control over the Dutch CMDs. Because the thing is, once I have the ability to suppress his air, well, his air force, but once I have the ability to suppress his ability to move anything in the Java Sea without it being potentially attacked, then it becomes very difficult for him to even function as a military out here. 
Obviously, you'll still be able to dig in on the actual islands. But the thing is, I'll be able to do reconnaissance. I'll be able to pick my targets. And then eventually, we'll land with overwhelming force. And then we'll begin the conquest of Java and Sumatra. We are preparing for other targets. Like, I'm preparing uh, the 4th Division detachment over here at uh, Kandari. They're being prepared to land at Balapapan. The uh, detachment at Makassar is being prepared to land over here at Danpasa. But the thing is, we have... Uh, well, after after we secure Ambon. But the thing is, Ambon is more or less neutralized here for the time being. It is uh, locked down with the actual troops there. Obviously, he still holds the base. But in time, we'll be able to uh, bombard him out of his position. Or starve him out of his position. Whichever comes first. But we will take the base. So, Manadao has fallen. Turnout has fallen. Kendari has fallen. Makassar has fallen. Kopang will fall. And those are the big airfields in the area, or at least the main airfields in the area. There are others, but uh, it's one of those things, it, it's not going to be really feasible for him to have aircraft there. We do have continuous landings over here. Hollandia was secured. Uh, Venema was secured. We secured Manus. We'll be securing this base over here next turn. We secured Mandang. Now Lei is under our control. No, sorry, Sonobu is under our control since last turn. But we do have these forces over here. So they're moving into Lay with elements of the 24th Infantry. These guys are moving into Gazmata. Oh, they would have been moving into Gazmata. Then, oh, near Gazmata, okay. But indeed, they're moving to uh, Finch, Finchhafen. Finchhafen. These guys are moving into Gazmata. So I'm going to secure these uh, these two bases. Sorry, uh, yeah, these two bases here. Gazmata, which is where I'm going to be moving the Air Division here. I think it's an Air Division or is it Air Fleet? Yeah, the 11th Air Fleet is going to be moved over here to Gazmata, which will enable all these bases in the area to actually benefit, uh, benefit from being able to launch torpedoes. This base will fall. I don't know if he's got any aircraft over there, but the fact is he's not going to be able to run any aircraft from there. Uh, we're running our torpedoes out this way, our submarines out this way, they're patrolling. We do spot a ship over here. The G3M2s are still on naval search. Which is fine, because the thing is with naval search, they're still able to attack enemy shipping. Uh, they'll launch, well, they'll drop bombs against them. Uh, but obviously we were looking more so to be able to spot for our submarines here in the area. What I have been doing is moving an ACM, so basically mine laying tender, well, a mine tender to each of these bases here as we go down the chain. Now, I am getting a little bit of cold feet towards the south. The reason is we are seeing a lot of movement down here. For example, we do see four ships over here, two of them are apparently are tankers. We did see a uh, tanker convoy along here some days ago. We were unfortunately unable to catch it. Uh, we did see some ships down here. We saw some destroyers. I saw some destroyers and some transports over here as well. So it feels like... It feels like he has either a build-up over here at Norfolk, Lord Howe. Definitely not Rahul, but who knows? Well, no, I'm going to say not at Rahul. But it feels like Norfolk Island or Lord Howe Island. He's He probably has some assets over there. Which is understandable, considering that we did attempt to take these islands some time ago. Unfortunately, that failed. It would have been nice had it succeeded, but uh, it's not major. We'll take them in the future. But the fact is, he's more than likely using Auckland, or he's using Wellington over here as well. These are very large naval bases. As you can see, he's got a size 5 port over here. He's got a size 5 port over here, level 3 airfield. Level 6 airfield over here, massive airfield. He does have a repair shipyard, he does have light industry and heavy industry. Uh, he does have resources here, but he doesn't actually have any homegrown fuel production over here. So see, he's going to have to import the fuel over here. So it's only natural that this is going to be a very large naval area. Well, something that's built up with a lot of traffic. So what I'm doing here then is move my submarines out. You're gonna put, this one's going to patrol here. I'm going to have one patrol in here. And then we're going to have the actual submarine with the flow plane patrol in here as well. So the idea is... I'm just, I just don't want to have, I don't want to have another Tarawa raid, basically. So all the ships that are in the area still are being moved out of the area. They're being moved back to truck for their own protection. That, and what we're going to have to do then is really evaluate what we have over here at truck. So all the ships that are needed are going to be shipped back to Japan or to where they can be made use of, really. So you can see our tankers have made it through over here to Roynamar. So the first time in forever, I forgot to dock these guys, unfortunately. But for the first time in forever, we're actually going to have some fuel over here in the in the Marsh Islands. Not a huge amount of fuel, but it is a little bit of fuel, just enough. But the good news is I can have like the ships that need that fuel just to move in here. They can actually take on that fuel, and then we'll have the ability to move them out if we need to do so. Uh, but indeed, we are looking towards moving the uh, submarines down into the areas. Like additional submarines are heading down this way, submarines are heading down this way. 
we are going to continue to patrol this area over here, basically the uh, shipping lanes as, as far as we can presume, uh, back to Palmyra and ultimately Pearl Harbor. The uh, Kidabatai is still stood down over here at Truck. They're undergoing repair at the moment in time. As you can see, Kage, Hiro, Soru, Shokaku, Zuikaku and Akagi, they're undergoing some repairs over here. I'm keeping them in a state of readiness, but you can see they're already starting to repair. Which is fantastic. I think it was Shokaku who had... Uh, one of them had... I think... I can't remember which one it was. But one of them had at least 10 damage. It might have been Soru. But you can see the damage is already starting to decrease over here, which is fantastic. You can see Hiei, uh, Kirishima over here receiving some repairs as well. Uh, Nagato, she can be repaired fully over here at truck. She's just going to take some time to be repaired. But she can and she will be fully repaired. But if the case comes down to it, then I will have her sally forth for battle. As uh, she's still very well armed. So, that's more or less what's going on here. More landings, more brutal action. Over here at Bataan, we continue to just bombard. Apparently it does have two fighters here. Another a bomber here now, some auxiliary, which is interesting. I'm going to be moving a base force down here to the bow. The reason being I can actually then run aircraft from here. But basically I can use this as a logistical jumping off point rather than Babardoir, but I would have Devao then. At least I'd have one that's a little bit more central. I'm going to be looking towards actually conquering this area, really shutting this area down. As at the moment he's still able to move through here. I do have naval bombers that are operating out from Clark Field. So the thing is they are hitting these ships multiple times each turn, at least some of the ships multiple times each turn. So eventually we will be able to shut this area down completely once he's just not able to move. He might be just low fuel. We did have our two destroyers over here that did sink the uh, light transport that was more than likely moving supply in and out. It's one of these things he might have thought to as being sneaky, but I suppose it's just me being lax there. We will be looking towards the Illusion Isles in the future. As you can see, we do have our H6K falls over here. So yep, these guys are patrolling this area. We do have uh, additional patrols over here. Additional patrols around Japan as well. Patrols out from Midway and Wake. From Roy Namur from Tarawa, from Funafuti, and from Luganville. So, we're expecting, um, well, I'm personally expecting a uh, USN carrier raid at some point in the future. I feel like his carriers could be, I mean, this is it, I'm, I'm only really spitballing here, but I feel like this is going to be the actual strategic axis on where his actual carriers might very well be. And I, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is where they are, maybe they're still over here at Pearl, Maybe they're down here at uh, New Zealand. Maybe they're anywhere in between this. It's hard to say where they are. But the thing is, I don't need to reveal the Kitabatai. I've conquered all I need to conquer down here in the South Pacific for this. I suppose for this campaign season, we will be looking towards additional targets in the near future. But for now, I more or less have all of the hard targets that I need to secure. New May will be secured in a matter of days, really. It's taken a long time at New May, but that's due to the actual terrain difficulties there. But it will fall in time. So it's really on... I suppose the onus is on him. It is on the allies here at the moment. He's going to be feeling the itch to use his carriers. And to be honest, it's like if I was him, I would say just don't. Just don't use the carriers. It's not worth it to reveal the carriers for the little gains that you may eventually get. It's one of these. But I imagine there's going to be those in the allied camp who are going to be pushing him towards being uh, more aggressive. But the thing is, it's all well and good being aggressive. But the thing is, once I know where his carriers are, then that gives me all the information in the world I need. Not even to really... I, it potentially is good information. It may allow for us to actually engage in battle. But the fact of knowing where the carriers are, that really is just spectacular information. And it's like, if we take a look over here at Numaya... Now we are going for a full attack over here at Dumea. Tomorrow's so we'll have a 444th, the 61st, 84th, and the 8th Tanker Regiments attacking, supported by the 2nd Field Artillery Regiment, the 17th Medium Field Artillery Regiment, the 5th, uh, the 5th, the 5th, and the 3rd Mortar Battalions over here. So we're going in for a full attack. You can see the numbers here aren't, aren't too bad. What we're going to do then is attack, and then attack probably the day after, and then rest the day after. I think we might go and break it up like that, try and make it a little bit random or something like that so he doesn't know what to expect. Not that it particularly matters, but I'm going to be looking towards the actual condition of the troops. We did inflict about 500 casualties the last time we attacked. I think we only took about 100 casualties, so we inflicted like 5 to 1 casualties on the uh, Allied forces over here at Numea last time. It was something around that sort of point. Maybe not exactly, so don't quote me. But the good news was we only had disabled forces where he actually had dis well destroyed and disabled squads. I mean, that was very good news. And this is it. New mail will come to an end at some point in the future. 
it has been sent to me a number of times uh, by people following the series that, well, what if he actually attempts to um, do something for the new mayor? And I suppose this is it. I've discussed this a few times in the actual stream, but really, as far as it goes, if he was to do something over here at Dumea, there's a number of different scenarios. I suppose the most plausible scenario, and probably the one that he would want to do most, is he would probably want to rescue at least an element of these troops over here. The reason being, if you rescue an element of those troops, you can actually rebuild it in the field. It does take a long time, but you can do it. But if you lose all the elements of the actual unit, then you have to uh, you have to rebuild them, and I think they arrive. I think they arrive back at the like the uh, national national capital or something like that. So if they were U.S. forces that arrived back in the U.S., if an Australian that arrived back in Australia, so it's one of those things of like it's in his interest to actually try and rescue them. But the thing is, obviously, that is very difficult, and I do not. I really don't think he would do it. I think it's a fool's errand. But really, it comes down to a situation of well, he's going to have to use a lot of force. I think a second scenario is uh, maybe in addition to the fact that he might be looking to uh, evacuate. I don't think he'd be looking to reinforce because the thing is it doesn't fix the uh, fundamental situation. Like New Caledonia is not an island he can retake without expending a lot of force. I mean a ridiculous amount of force. I think uh, the US will have the 1st and 2nd Marine Divisions. I'm not entirely sure when they gain them. See, this is what I like about not having to play the Allies and play by email, is I don't really have this information. I'm not interested in finding out because it actually does add to the actual gameplay for me because it's one of these things of, well, the Japanese didn't know when the 1st or 2nd Marine Divisions would exactly arrive, so I don't want to know either. It's one of these, really. But yes, they will be arrived at some point in the future, but the thing is, he could potentially land the division there, or land two divisions there if he wanted to do so, or additional forces to that. But the thing is, it is all times free terrain on the island of New Caledonia. And we can double check that. So if I go ahead, if we take a look over here, you can see Jungle Rough, Jungle Rough, Jungle Rough, Jungle Rough, and Jungle. So Comac is not so bad, but all of this is Jungle Rough, which is not good. Very good, uh, very good as a defender, as we found out. But the thing is, the, the situation, it cannot go on over here at Numea. Like, we are able to resupply our forces each turn. He's only got so much supply over here, and to be honest, it's incredible how much supply he's had over here at Numea. But the thing is, once it runs out, then his time has run out. But the thing is, if we can break his force before that, then at least we'll be able to actually gain that supply. We'll be able to capture that supply, so that'd be a nice bonus. But we'll have to see over here. He's definitely got enough to keep the forces going for the time being, so we are going to have to just wipe them out, just completely annihilate them. But we can do that. It's going to take some time, but we can definitely do that. We've got about 200... Yeah, 296 assault value here. There is another... Let's see, another... Um, another 56 there marching. They're currently marching towards us at Dumer, but I'm probably going to have them stop over here at Lafoa uh, to actually garrison that. We do have a small garrison over here at Komak, which is only 27 AV, but it's still 27 AV of Japanese forces. Our forces, uh, they don't surrender. <laughs> the Japanese forces do not tend to surrender. So the thing is, we would fight to the death. And the thing is, if he actually does attempt to land over here in New Caledonia, I think the best description I've heard is it would become a tar baby. Basically, it would be something he would not be able to get out of very easily. It would really... It'd drain a lot of assets. It would be a horrendous mistake. A massive mistake on his part. So I do not think he'd do this. So then in the last scenario, I suppose you could say, or one of the last scenarios is, well, what if he attempts to do this with the actual USN carriers? Which he could potentially do so. I mean, having the USN carriers would obviously allow him to do a great many, great many things. But it's like, as far as I'm concerned, um, I suppose the way to imagine it is... The uh, United States carriers are the tiger. So, this is it. You, you, you don't chase the tiger. We don't chase the tiger's tail. Because the thing is, we're, we're trying to catch him here and he's already over here. So never going to be able to catch him like that. So really, what we need to do then is to uh, cage the tiger. Which, <laughs> I know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm doing it deliberately Asiatic just to be uh, rather more interesting. So, this is it really. If he was to land, let's say he lands a force over here then that means that his carriers are going to have to be in like a certain certain radius around that area. They're not going to be able to really move outside that area because the thing is he'll have so much invested in that area. So maybe like troop transports, maybe like uh, transports in general, fuel, stuff like that. He's not going to really want to leave that. So as far as I'm concerned, even if he does bring the US and carriers, <clears throat> I may 
may attempt to launch a night strike with my bombers at Luganville, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm probably going to go for the uh, policy of, um, I suppose, uh, hmm, passive, passive resistance, I suppose. So the reason is he may bomb our forces in Caledonia, he may bombard them with actual cruisers or something like that, or battleships or something like that. I don't think he's going to have a battleship down here, but probably cruisers. Uh, we know he has cruisers around here, at least two heavy cruisers, potentially more. Uh, there were the ones that did escape us earlier, so probably got a good few heavy cruisers around here. But the thing is, he can bombard us, but even even if he causes a thousand, two thousand, three thousand casualties, it's not going to make a difference. The strategic situation on New Caledonia is uh, irrevocable, in my opinion. It's just not going to be, It just, he'd have to land a massive amount of force tomorrow, really, to be able to uh, reverse the situation in any, any great matter, in any great degree. But the thing is, it'd be great. <laughs> it would be fantastic. I suppose the only viable scenario is where he would have to commit with maximum force. Uh, he'd have to try and beat us out from New Mayor, and then he would just evacuate. But the thing is, if he does that, then I can rouse the Kitabatai. The only only reason why I bring the Kitabatai down here, even if he brings carriers, I'm not interested in bringing the Kitabatai. The reason is, it's actually much scarier. It really plays more to our advantage. Even even if the Kitabatai is actually sat at port doing jack all, in a number of ways they're more dangerous because the fact is, it really affects his actual strategy if he doesn't know where they are. When you know where a natural threat is, then you can respond to that threat. But if you don't know where that threat is, you can't. So it's one of these things. If the enemy carriers are going to be raiding down here in the Coral Sea, then fine. I'll try to resist with land-based aircraft. But I'm not going to bring the Kitabatai to try and chase them. If I do rouse the Kitabatai, it is because he's going to be... Well, he's having to stay in the area. He's having to remain in the area. Or what I might do then is, let's say... Let's say the... Um, okay, a better scenario is, let's say... Okay. So, the enemy carriers are moving up over here, raiding New Caledonia, raiding this way, raiding this way and that way. What I'd be looking at doing then is ignoring that. And in fact, moving down here, ideally undetected. And basically moving in such a way to cut off his line of retreat as much as I was able to. So I'd be looking towards having land-based air power over here to just make that possible to really get the location. But yeah, that, that's the way we cage the tiger. We force him into the area of our choosing. And the thing is, if we could force him into the Coral Sea, sure, he can actually make harbour in Australia. But the thing is, I'd rather have him pinned in one area. Even if he has support, even if he has fuel, that, that's irrelevant. It doesn't particularly matter. He's going to have that at other bases anyway. But if I could have him pinned in this area here, then I would consider that a potential victory because then I could actually look towards striking at him in port, really trying to use our critical mass and really try and use that against him. It's one of these things, would I be able to touch him in port over here at uh, Australia? Probably, mm, probably not the best idea. It could be potentially done, but it would be very risky because then obviously you'd be able to use his own land-based aircraft over here. And obviously it's one of these things, you might be able to hit the actual carriers in port, but the thing is you're not as likely to sink them unless they're out at sea. But the fact is, at least I know where the enemy carriers were, and I could do... I could take measures to uh, prevent them escaping, or at least actually make their escape harder. But the thing is then, um, I could potentially look towards attacking Pago Pago, or New Zealand... To, well, not so much Zealand, uh, New Zealand is too far, but yeah, potentially attacking other outposts. <sighs> a lot of talking there, so I think that's, uh, that's about it. Obviously, there's a lot going on here. Uh, something I'm going to be doing as well is in the R&D. We have made a few changes. Uh, well, not yet, but we're going to make more changes. But for example, what I'm going to be doing here then is having the KI-44 Tojos. And we're going to have that change out to the KI-44 2A. Which is... Over here. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be changing that to the KI-44 2A, which arrives at the same time. Uh, yeah, it arrives at the same time. But the reason why I bring that aircraft is the reason being, let's see, KI-44 Tojo. KI-44 2A. So you can see they do arrive at the same time, but the 2A has 16 miles on top of the uh, Tojo. Cruise speed is the same, endurance is a little bit less. The range is actually higher. The altitude is higher, the climb rate is significantly better, maneuverability is slightly higher, durability is the same, no armor, max load is the same, 
Service rate is the same. Gun value is the same. As far as I can tell. But the fact is, yeah, the gun the guns are the same. The um twin 7.7s and the dual, yeah, the twin 12.7s. But the fact is I can actually mount uh 200 kilograms of bombs. Which doesn't seem like a lot. But to be honest, it could be really very good just to have that ability to actually just, just if it's just one of these things, if you have the uh, capacity and it could be helpful, then it would be nice to actually have the ability to launch bombs, well, drop bombs. It's one of those like maybe it could be handy. But I, we are marching the fifty-sixth division here from Buna to Port Moresby. Now we are able to transfer supplies from Buna across the actual uh, lack of roads over here, well, across the lack of infrastructure. Uh, so we'll not have a uh, really high level of uh, supply transfer. We'll have a lot of wastage, but that's fine. What I can do is potentially have them supplied via air if necessary, but we'll move in a lot of supply here. It's one of those things of, well, we could have gone round here and navally invaded at Port Moresby. But the thing is, it is a dangerous task. It obviously is very close to Australia. It plays into his strength there. It's playing into the actual enemy's area of uh, operations here with their aircraft. So we're going to not do that. These men are marching. It's going to take them a long while to march. But at least in the meantime, they are continuously building up the planning there for Port Moresby. So they'll arrive with a bunch of fatigue. But the fact is, what I'm looking towards doing here then is locking down the actual Port Moresby area. And just really stopping any reinforcements or evacuations. I mean, well, it's one of these. If you evacuate, I'd love to actually put a torpedo into it. But it's one of these things like, we are going to be taking the base at Port Moresby at some point in the future, which is going to be quite nice. I mean, that's 320 victory points over there, which would be very good. New Mayor is uh, it's only worth 30, 30 to us, but it's worth 300 to the Allies. So I sort of owes, really. I mean, Luganville is actually worth quite a lot to us, which is quite good. Yeah, some of these other islands, not so much. Rebel, yeah, you can see. But yeah, it's going to be great. Okay. So, until next time, guys. Thank you for watching, and I do hope you've enjoyed this. I know it's been very long-winded, and I apologize for getting tongue-tied. <laughs> but it's one of these things I get really excited, because a lot is going to happen tomorrow, and I really cannot wait. But just to go over the actual main point here at the beginning of the actual uh, episode is Changsha is going to be bloody, but we will be able to recover from that, and we will be able to defeat China if things go well. Even if I don't get the base over here, we're still in a very good position to actually defeat the Chinese forces here in this area. It's going to be very interesting. Very, very interesting. So I'm going to say Tenno Haika Banzai, guys, and thank you so very much for watching. If you guys do enjoy my content, please do consider becoming a patron of mine. It really does help me out. Supporting the channel myself, just it makes a massive difference. It means I can buy new books. It means I can do a lot more things to the channel, improve the equipment. Just so much to be done here. The microphone that I'm using right now, I was able to buy with a, um, well, with support from a very kind viewer. Uh, so you know who you are if you're still watching. But yeah, I mean, he sent me £50 to help me get this microphone, which was fantastic. It meant I could go for a better microphone, which is fantastic. I'm actually considering using the funds uh, from Patreon uh, to potentially invest in a new microphone, an even better microphone, or even potentially like an investment in uh, a new artist to actually make a new a new uh, print, which would be fantastic. Of course, the original Haruna prints are still available, and if you guys would like one, uh, do go ahead and let me know down in the comments, or send me a private message. Either or, you can obviously see them on my uh, Patreon page as well. So, long-winded, that is my shilling. Until next time, thank you and goodbye, guys. See you later.